Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Paul's, Paul's writing here and says, you know, we rejoice in tribulation because it puts patience to work. He's not rejoicing in the tribulation because the tribulation is good for him in the sense of, you know, getting, you know, something coming against you is, is just lovely. It's that you can put your patience to work. Now, the Bible tells us that patience possess our souls. Amen? We possess our souls with patience. Why? Because when you know the answer, when you know the end, you can stand in the storm that stands between you and the end. Because you're going to come out on the other side with what you know is the end. Don't know how you're going to get there. I'm going to be honest with you, I've looked at some things in the past couple of years, and I'm going, how are we going to get there? It doesn't matter how we get there, we're going to get there. Why? Because our faith says this is the end, the fulfillment of the promise of God. Therefore, I stand, I stand and, and I rejoice even in the tribulation because now patience can possess my soul. We can stand the storms, make it through, not barely make it through, not make it in by the skin of our teeth, but come in victorious, overcomers, hallelujah, over, as winners, victorious in Jesus Christ because our faith says this is the end. Amen. Somebody say glory. Somebody, say, somebody else say glory to God for our faith. And I want to thank the Dunamis Youth Group for my new Bible. I love this. This is like, you know, half or a third the weight of my other Bible. You know, and all the pages are still in it. They're not falling out. I'm not constantly having to put them back in. All right. For when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man would some even, even dare to die. But God commanded his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being, now being justified by his blood. I'm going to tell you, a few years ago, I got really upset because one, one of your main line denominations decided they were going to take the blood out of all their hymnals and, take, and stop teaching on the blood, stop preaching on the blood, sending that out through their whole denomination because it made it a barbaric religion. I'm going to tell you something. I don't care what you call it. Without the blood, you're not going to heaven. Hello. We're, and, and, this, and if you don't have the blood, you're not justified. Because here Paul writes and says, being, being therefore justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. Thank God for the blood. I said, thank God for the blood. Who entered in one, uh, once with his own blood, having obtained an eternal redemption for us. Remember that? Uh, Hebrews chapter 9. I believe down around verse 12 or 13 and 7, it says, For the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctify to the purifying of the flesh. Well, that was good. They got covered up for a year. They had atonement for one year. And they had to come back next year and go through the whole thing again and had the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer. They get covered up for another year. But I want you to know, glory to God, the next verse went on and said this, how much more, thank God for the how much more, shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience. Oh, glory be to God. I thank God for the justification by the blood of Jesus. Glory to God. Because it was not a covering of sin. Hallelujah. <clears throat> there was not a continual remembrance that you were living in sin, that you had been a sinner. Oh, glory be to God. How much more shall the blood of Christ purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Oh, glory be to God. I said glory be to God. Hallelujah. Under that old covenant, they could go in there and they could get it covered up and put it off to the next Passover. And they kind of would go walk out and go, well, I'm covered for a year. Come on now. But once you went, hallelujah, to the mercy seat of God, come on, church, hallelujah, and declared the lordship of Jesus Christ over your life and accepted his, his cleansing power, hallelujah. You were washed by the blood. And the Bible says that all those other things could take care of your flesh. 
But if you go back and read, for, read, read in that, that section of Hebrews in chapter 9 and so forth, it talks about that all the ordinances and the carnal ordinances and the washings and all these different things, there was still the continual reminder. They could not do away with the conscience of sin. Oh, thank God. <laughs> but one mightier, one greater, one more, more powerful came, hallelujah. And his blood carried with it not the covering of sin, hallelujah, but the absolute removal and cleansing and, and, and remediation of sin. You ever heard of, you know, people have to remediate homes and that kind of stuff? You know, if they've got, you know, uh, uh, asbestos so they got black mold they got to come in with hazmat suits and they have to they have to get rid of it like it was never there hallelujah and not only did the blood of jesus you know cleanse do do it did everything that the blood of the bulls and goats and sprinkling of the ashes have because it says how much more it didn't say and in lieu of that or it didn't say in, in, in contrast to that it said how much more Look over there in Hebrews chapter 9. You see it. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience to serve the living God. Amen. Purge your conscience from dead works. I'm sorry. To serve the living God. Amen. Isn't that good news? So that's what justification has done for us. I don't, I'm so glad that around what we call Easter, and that's really a bad, that's a horrible, horrible translation of the word. Because the word in the Greek is paschal. Passover. And it's just simply because the King Jimmy guys got together, and when they got to there, you know, they, they were trying to put the, uh, come up with a rec reconciliatory uh, version of the Bible, make everybody happy. And uh, by that time, the word Easter had become associated with the date of Passover. And so they just called it Easter. It's just a horrible translation. It's not, it's not even a translation. It was just politically done. They just stuck it in there because. So you believe in the inerrancy of the word of God? Yeah. I don't believe in the inerrancy necessarily of, of translators who put something in there that just, that just wasn't right. It doesn't change with that, that passage because the Passover is Paschal. Okay? So, so we, don't, we, we really serve, we, 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 we celebrate on Passover Sunday. It's really Resurrection Sunday to the church. Okay? We are not serving Ishtar, the Greek god of fertility, goddess of fertility. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8. The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not made manifest, while as yet the first tabernacle was standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Oh, can, you, can you just sit here with me and meditate on that for Say la. Everything they did, every sacrifice they made, every time they went to Jerusalem, every time they did something with the high priest, all of that never did something that everybody desired. It never purged their conscience from dead works. Are y'all here? They were constantly reminded that they were sinners. Are you here? Have you gone home? which stood only in meats and drinks and divers' washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, not earthly. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal Redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, I'm going to say something here. I'm going to probably upset some folks. I really don't care. Because if this upsets you, you need to be upset. I 
cannot understand why somebody would want to argue for their position that because they're under grace, they can go, they can go live in the dead works when the blood of Jesus was shed to purge your conscience from dead works so you could serve the living God. And we're not talking about serving him in the, in the power of the flesh. But I am telling you, people, and I, I'm not saying that everybody that's at the forefront saying, is saying that. But there are people who say it, and I've, and I've had some discussions with them, and they're lily birds. Things like, I can live with my girlfriend and live in fornication. It don't matter because I'm under grace. Why would you want to live in dead works? When the blood of Jesus purged your conscience from those dead works in order... To empower you, that was the grace of God now empowers you to serve the living God. The one that sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why would you want to live in the very thing he came to set you free from? You know? Oh, we want to drink wine in our church. Why? Why? Because I like the way it makes me feel. Go pray in the Holy Ghost. Get filled up with the Spirit, glory to God. Get in time. It could be like a day of the book, uh, uh, the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost fell. And they all came out and said, these men are full of new wine. And they said, we're not drunk like you think we are. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days I will pour out my Spirit. On all flesh, Peter said that what they were doing, they were not intoxicated with wine made by the hands of men. They were intoxicated by the spirit of the living God. How do they were inebriated? And that's exactly what these are not drunk as you suppose. They're drunk, not like you think. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. <clears throat> Why are people trying to justify going back to the very works that God sent Jesus to deliver them from? And with that, I get a hearty, Amen. or help me along. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And for this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament, or New Covenant, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, in which our call might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Then he goes on and begins to talk about more, more and more. There's just more here. We, we're not doing Hebrews yet. But I wanted to get there. I, had, I got over there. I can't get away from there because we're talking about being justified by his blood. You've been declared righteous by his blood. And then we go to Hebrews and find out what his, what his blood was there for. It was, to, it was to redeem us. It was to bring us to a point where the very consciousness of sin, the very power of the dead works, no longer has authority over us. Amen. Now, we don't have time to get here tonight because we got started a little bit later than we to this part. Uh, but Paul writes over in, in, the, in the, uh, the seventh chapter. Oh, no, it's this chapter. We might get there. We might get there. No, we're in five, aren't we? Yeah. Chapter six. <clears throat> we're not going to get there. But Paul tells us, I'm going to go ahead and get a little ahead of myself by a week. That whoever you yield your members to, your servants to it. Well, I'm, I'm you know, you read the whole thing in context. He, had, he says that we, we're not bound by that, but if you yield your members to it. As a matter of fact, he said, actually says there in chapter 6, Therefore, do not yield your members as servants of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. There is a statement here that you have the, op, you have the authority of which one you yield to. Grace doesn't, grace doesn't make you do stuff. Being justified doesn't make you do stuff that you don't hook up with and work with. If that's the case, God will never let Adam sin in the garden. We still are free will agents. All right. Uh, back up here in verse... Where, 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 nine. Much more than being justified by his blood, we should be saved from the wrath through him. 
What's going to save you? His blood. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the blood of the death of his son, so much more being reconciled, we should be saved by his life. Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have received the atonement. Now, the word atonement here is not, uh, not the right word for our understanding. If you look at it as Old Testament atonement, it's an inaccurate view. The word here means exchange or the reconciliation, okay? So it's, it's the, the word here would be better translated through the exchange, identification. He identified with us, we identify with him. Under the old covenant, there was an exchange, but it was a temporary exchange, okay? It was only a covering for a period of time. All right? So really, we, we've been redeemed. We've been justified. So we're not living in an, in an old covenant. You've got, you you got to get rid of the old covenant mindset in, in reference to this word now that we're in the new covenant and Jesus has attained an eternal redemption for us. So that changes it. It went from a temporary one-year holdover to an eternal redemption for us. Under the old covenant, atonement was a promissory note. Under the new covenant, there has actually been an exchange. Our nature, his nature for our nature. Oh, glory. Somebody ought to get Pentecostal right now. Yeah. Hallelujah. I said somebody ought to have the, I mean, the, the Pentecostal chicken going on. Glory to God. Need to get somebody here with an old beehive hair doing a bunch of bobby pins and they get to shaking and letting them think, ding, 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 ding. I tell people I grew up with the only kind of church you had to wear safety goggles when there was a move of the Holy Ghost. Because then women get that old hair up there like this and they, you know, they get to shaking and then bobby pins start flying out. You had to have something on your eyes to protect them. I'm just I'm teasing. I'm teasing. And not so only, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom now we have the exchange. We have experienced an identification exchange. Somebody shout glory. glory. Amen. Therefore, if any man be, we talked about this when we were covering Corinthians. Therefore, if any man, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, but all things have become new. Verse 18 starts out and says this, and all things are of God. Goes down to verse 21 and says, now, now I know King Jimmy has the words to be in there, but they're italicized, meaning they're not in the Greek. So let's quote it without the added words. For he who knew no sin was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Exchange. He took our nature and took the penalty and the consequences and the judgment of our nature. Hallelujah. So that when God, by the glory of God, raised him up from the dead, and we confess his lordship, he now imparts his nature. We have an exchange between the dead, fallen nature and the resurrected life nature of Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of God or declared, right, declared, declared righteous or justified by God. Same Greek word. Ooh, if that don't make a Pentecostal out of you, nothing will. Hallelujah. Or at least a shouting Baptist. Amen. And there's some shouting Baptists. Don't you think they don't shout? There's some, you get a good old Southern gospel group in there, they'll shout. <clears throat> Amen. Are you here? You gone home? Yeah, you should have old shouting Methodist. Glory to God. It says here we not, listen to this. But we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have when? Come on now. We have verse, verse 11. By whom we have now. Come on somebody. Now received the exchange. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Nobody join me. Y'all just sat there like a bunch of knots on the log. Hello. Like what somebody said, a knot, a knot on a pickle. A bump on a pickle. Wherefore, oh, glory. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, how about, how about by how many men? 
Then you got these people going out here saying that you know that you know that they really don't believe that the little Adam and Eve don't believe you know they, a lot of stuff in Genesis is a myth and you know just because they won some record award don't make them an expert on anything. Hello. It says by one man sin entered into the world, not by you know a, a whole. It's by one man. Amen. And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. Why? Because it came through the, the, the line of the one man. And death by sin. Uh, uh, and, death, so, and so death passed upon all men for all that have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed where there was no law. Nevertheless, you know, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Now, the nature of sin was passed on. That's what it's talking about. When it says death here, it's talking about the nature of sin. It was a death nature. Remember God told Adam in Genesis, he said, you know, you may eat the, free, the, the, the trees of the knowledge of good and evil, but of the tree, uh, but I'm sorry, any tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat from the day that thou doest, thou shalt surely die. Now, King James, because, because of the way they did the translation, sometimes loses, because they were doing word for word. They didn't, they didn't uh, vary with the tenses and stuff. So if, if it took five words to create the tense, they didn't do it. Okay? Literally, the Hebrew says, in the day that thou eatest thereof, in dying, you will die. <coughs> giving us a, a light or a, a, a um, glimpse in the Second Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. For I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, man is a spirit. He possesses a soul. He lives in a body. We do know that the, you know, the, that the spirit without the body is, the body without the spirit is dead. And to be absent from the body for the Christian is to be present with the Lord. Well, what do you mean absent from your body? You left your earth suit. You can't go into outer space without a, without a space suit on. It'll kill you. The temperature and the lack of oxygen and the lack of, uh, of, um, of uh, pressure, blood won't even pump. All right? You have to have a pressurized suit on. You've got to be in a pressurized cabin. You've got to have, so you've got to have a space suit on. To operate in the earthly realm, you've got to have an earth suit called your body. God, and, and you notice that when Adam ate the fruit, he didn't fall over dead physically. He did die spiritually. That's how they knew they were naked. Why? Wow, the glory went out. Now remember that when they ate it, they, their eyes were opened and they saw that they were naked and they covered themselves. Now remember, remember what happened with Moses in the mount and also with Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration? When Moses went out and got in the presence of God, they had to put a veil over his face. And you got to understand that this, this is just absorbing the glory in his flesh as it communed with him. But Adam and Eve were born of God or created by God. He put his spirit in them. The glory was shining out of them. They weren't naked. Some bozos come along and go, we're going to have a nudist call and be like Adam and Eve in the garden, not unless you got the glory coming out of you. Amen. They couldn't see they were naked because they were glowing with the glory. Oh, that make you shout. Moses went up the mountain, got with God for 40 days, and, and he came down. They put a veil. He just absorbed the glory, and it, it was so bright they couldn't look on him. Peter and, the, and, and James and John woke up, and there Jesus is where he had just let the glory out for a moment. And it changed the rain, his raiment. It bleached them by the glory just shining out from them. They called them bound of transfiguration. Oh, glory to God. I said glory to God. Adam and Eve weren't naked until the fall. And then when he sinned, the moment that she ate the fruit and gave it to him, he ate it, the light went out, What the glory went out, they died spiritually. Does not mean cessation of existence. It means they were no longer in communion and harmony with the Father, with God. See, death in the biblical terms doesn't mean to cease to exist. Look it up. All the people who get cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death, are people who are already dead. 
How can they get raised back up? Because they don't cease to exist. Death is a term for separation biblically. Physical death is the separation of the human spirit from the human body. You still exist, just not in your body, which, which now you are no longer legally able to operate in the earth realm. Okay? To be spiritually dead means to be separated from God who is life. In this case, life doesn't mean existence in the fact that he exists. It, mean, it is what he is. He, is. he is good. He is glorious. He is love. He, it's all the things that that life entails. Death is the absence of what God is. Spiritual death is the absence of what God the Father is and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Okay? So, <clears throat> even though sin wasn't uncounted to people, they were still dead spiritually. And death reigned from Adam to Moses. Then the law came, and now they were accounted, their sins were accounted for. It says here, so, y'all with me on all that? Now, that's, that's a real quick synopsis. All right? Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Even though they had not committed high treason, death still reigned over them. They were still spiritually dead people. They were still alienated from the life of God. They had to receive the Messiah that was to come. And if you study uh, the New Testament, it says that Jesus went and preached to the captives in prison. Hallelujah. Who is, uh, after the cemetery of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if the, the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, have, Christ has abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Christ Jesus. In other words, it's saying that the, that the power of the grace of God is greater than the power of Adam's transgression. Glory be to God. That, and let me see, you, you can just kind of jump in here and, and go off a different way. We're not going to go too far. But it's telling us this, that Satan no longer has dominion over us because we are now under the grace of God. Amen. Now you can give him dominion with your stupid mouth and your actions. Amen. But he can't enforce it on you. Unwillingly. You go take a needle, shoot up heroin and overdose and die. God did not do that to you. Amen. Bozo, you gave yourself over to the devil. So we don't know why the Lord took them. The Lord didn't take them. Heroin took them. We don't know why God had it. God, why the Lord wanted to do that. You, you hear some people say some of the dumbest stuff. God came to justify us, to deliver us from the authority of Satan. Amen. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came unto all men <clears throat> to condemnation, even so the righteousness of one, the free gift unto all men, and the justification or being declared righteous, the justification of life. For as one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but there where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Thank God. Where sin became more known and became more prevalent and more understood that this is sin, the grace of God was there to deliver us. That as sin had reigned unto death, even so grace reigned through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. I can't leave this week without reading verse 1 and 2 of the next verse. What shall we say then? As some slanderously do. Shall we continue? They will not say they say this. But their actions say this. Remember this old saying? Your walk, your talk walks and your walk talks. But your walk talks much further than your talk walks. Y'all get all that? How you live says a lot more than what you say about how you live. 
Your walk talks and your talk walks, but your, talk, your, your walk talks much further than your talk walks. Did I lose y'all? Some of you are going to be going home like, now how'd that go? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul rhetorically saying that. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in therein? Now he spends this whole next chapter telling you about not yielding your members and stuff. Okay? So. We are declared righteous by the blood of Jesus. We're living under the authority of a righteous kingdom. We're living by the power of God under grace through faith. Hallelujah. Amen. And we're to live not in the realm of death. We don't want to live in the things that are dead works. We want to live in the things that are life. Amen. What do you mean dead works? Well, I mean, yeah, they're running. Well, I could, I could go out and, 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 and sleep with all the women I want to sleep with, and it don't matter because I'm under grace, I'm going to heaven. Is that how shallow you are? As long as you get to go to heaven, you don't care? The word says, come out from among them and be ye separate. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Therefore, put off the old man. Paul wrote the church said, put off the old man and put on the new man, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. He didn't say, just keep, just keep limping along and make it into heaven. So we think we make people feel better by saying stuff and, and, you know, and by, by not letting them be challenged by the scriptures to change and to grow. And I'll and I, I just be real honest, all you wine bibbers and beer drinkers and all you people who think that you know, all the intoxicating things of the world are, are cool for you to do and you're a cool Christian, just remember there are people watching you and there are alcoholics who are watching you and there are people who've been addicted to things watching you. Why don't you say, I, well, I just sit and watch porn every other week because it just helps my love life with my wife. That went over big. Amen. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We have been delivered from dead works. Let's go serve the Lord and get as far away from the things of the world as we can get. Or Jesus turned the water into wine. Think about this for a second. We said this one time before. Think about this. The Bible does for sure absolutely expressly prohibit uh, drunkenness. And also said this, that, at, you know, that when Jesus turned the water into wine, they came to the governor. He said that most people wait till men, men have well drunk and bring out, the, bring out the bad taste and stuff. They're well drunk. Why, how could Jesus turn it into alcoholic wine, which would further intoxicate them when the Bible prohibits intoxication? Something to think about. How could the master get people drunker when his own word prohibits them being drunk? Because people use that all the time as a claim that's all right to drink. Well, I just... I don't know. Let you figure that one out. But it's short, that short, you know, it doesn't make sense that he can make him drunker when he's, his word prohibits him. That would be wrong for him to violate his own word. Amen. Somebody else shot glory. Hello, I'm Pastor Ed Taylor of Faith and Victory Church here in Greensboro, North Carolina. We just finished another powerful Bible study here at Faith and Victory Church and a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord as we learn uh, about the things of God. I want to take an opportunity here to share with you something that's very uh, strong in our hearts and very important to us. We've begun a financial campaign referred to as FVC Revive. That's found on GoFundMe. And what we're asking people to do is to go to the GoFundMe site, backslash FVC Revive, and um, check it out, see what's going on with us. We've been in Greensboro for now for a number of years. God's used us mightily. We've had miracles, signs, wonders, people healed, saved, uh, good things, gone all over the world and preached the gospel, use our television ministry, reach all kinds of nations, including uh, uh, communist China. We go in there on a regular basis with our, our, our broadcast. And the past few years, we've just taken kind of a, a little bit of a, uh, well, not a little bit, a pretty big hit financially. And what we're doing is asking you to consider 
supporting us, paying off all the debt that we've accrued over the past few years, and uh, giving us capital uh, flow, cash flow, so that we can do more of the things that are really in our heart to do. Uh, missions trips, reaching out to our community uh, that have been limited uh, as of the past couple of years, and, and just getting us in a better position financially. Um, we're, we're not asking one person to do it all. We're just asking all those that are watching this maybe to consider that, uh, think about it, see if it would be a good thing to you. Or just, you just want to do it because it's, it seems good to you. And uh, we would be really blessed if you would and you did. We know that if everybody watches our broadcast would give, a, you know, like $100, uh, we would be out of debt. Just, just from the just one time, never, never again. Ne wouldn't have to do it ever again. Just a one-time gift by all those who watch our broadcast would completely er eliminate our debt with one swipe and uh, put us in a better position to do what God's called us to. You know, um, some people may say, "Well, that's not faith to present a need." Yet the Apostle Paul wrote into the church and said, "You sent once and again unto my necessity." He also uh, was out taking up collections for the church at Jerusalem. Even to one church, he wrote and said, "Like I'm sending the guy, I'm sending the guys in there to strong arm you because if you don't." have it ready when they get there everybody's going to be embarrassed so I, now he said it real in the king james he said it real sweet but in actuality he was letting them know i expect you to have the money ready so we have to let people know what's going on we have a specific call here and uh god uses we haven't fulfilled our call we haven't finished our call we want to and so we're looking forward to seeing this um, this campaign go forward. We're looking forward to seeing the money come in and us paying off all the debt and then putting money in the bank so that we can do uh, things that God has for us to do. Pay off our camera equipment, uh, go on missions trips, have the capital flow to advertise and let people know that we're here, to do outreaches in the community and, and to do different things. There's so many things that we desire to do that we need to be in the financial position to do. So I appreciate you taking this, uh, these few minutes to listen to this. I appreciate you um, at least considering it. If you don't, well, you want to, that's fine. Uh, maybe God will speak to someone else or someone else will put it in the heart, and that's okay. We don't have you feel any pressure at all. But here's the, here's the need. We have the opportunity to uh, uh, all over the world get involved here. So if it's on your heart to do that and it seems good to you, we appreciate it. But we bless you anyway. Whether you give or don't give, we just speak blessing over you and trust that we'll be able to continue to come to your homes and to your businesses or wherever you are watching our broadcast and be able to minister life to you from the Word of God. We speak blessings over you, and thank you for uh, taking this time. In Jesus' name, God bless you. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address PO Box 7752 Greensboro, North Carolina 27417 If you would like to contribute to our ministry please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button Thank you and may God richly bless you for your giving